Good evening. I'm Josephine Novantoglu. Graduate of Postdoctoral Studies is pleased to welcome you to this year's Tomlinson's Talks. This event has been organized to honor Dr. Richard H. Tomlinson and his very generous contribution to graduate research at McGill University. We have planned what we are sure to be a memorable showcase of exceptional research that Thompson scholars are doing. We decided to pursue a virtual format this year again for the Thompson Talks due to the uncertainty around planning a live event at the beginning of 2022. And we wanted to give this year's Thompson Scholars an opportunity to present and showcase their research. We are proud to announce that the 2022 Thomason Talks have been awarded the Virtual Sustainable Event Certification by McGill Sustainable Events and the Office of Sustainability. Many of us, including our scholars, are virtually joining the talks from all over the world. I would like to take a moment to acknowledge and bring into this virtual space some qualities of the physical space on which McGill University is located. We acknowledge that McGill University is located on land which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst indigenous peoples, including the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabeg nations. McGill honors, recognizes, and respects these nations as the traditional stewards of the lands and waters on which we meet. In the past, the Tomlinson talks were filmed and presented to Dr. Tomlinson, who enjoyed watching all the talks from the scholars. And we wanted to thank him for his support and co commitment to graduate studies. Fortunately, Dr. Tomlinson passed away on January 28, 2018, at the age of 94, leaving behind a remarkable legacy and generosity to McGill University and its students. So just like to give you a little bit of a background on Dr. Tomlinson. Dr. Tomlinson graduated from McGill with a PhD in chemistry in 1948. And I think he was the last student of Otto Mass. He held postdoctoral fellowships at the National Research Council of Canada and in Cambridge. At the end, he, 1950, he joined the Department of Chemistry at McMaster University, becoming chair and at the end, emeritus professor. He was the founding director of Genom Corporation, which became a major manufacturer of digital signaling process, as well as world's largest supplier of microchips for hearing aids. Dr. Tomlinson made many generous gifts to McGill over his life, one of which is the Tomlinson Doctoral Fellowship. And just to put a bit of context into these awards, in 2000, he created the Dr. Richard H. Tomlinson Fellowship Program. These doctoral fellowships are worth $35,000 a year, and about a dozen new candidates are chosen every year, with funding provided for up to three years. So this is a very significant contribution to recruiting and supporting exceptional graduate students at McGill. What was remarkable is that in 2000, when the gift was made, it was a totality of 64 million, and it was the largest gift ever made in support of higher education in Canada at the time. The aim is really to recruit high caliber students to McGill University. So it's one of our most prestigious programs and it really fosters exceptional graduate uh, work at one of Canada's leading research intensive universities. Since the establishment of the fellowship in 2000, the Tomlinson talks have been a recurring event to showcase graduate research excellence at McGill. Today, you'll be hearing from three Tomlinson scholars from a range of disciplines. Before we begin, I would like to take a moment now to present you a brief video in Dr. Tomlinson's memory. As I said, when he was alive, he would be present at the talks. Later on, we would send him recordings of the talks. And after his death in 2018, we produced a video to commemorate uh, his legacy. Please join me in celebrating his life achievements, as well as his generous contributions to McGill University.
Now I would like to introduce our moderator, uh, Professor Tabitha Sparks, who's going to be leading this evening's uh, question and answer period, as well as the introductions, is Associate Dean of Graduate Studies in the Faculty of Arts, as well as an Associate Professor in the Department of English. She also served as a Graduate Program Director in the Department of English from 2015 to 2017. She has uh, graciously accepted to moderate the talks, and we're very pleased that she's here. So I would like to welcome her to say a few words about the Thomason Talks before we hear from our scholars. Thank you, Josephine, and thank you to everyone who's here. My name is Tabitha Sparks, and I'm Associate Dean of Research and Graduate Studies in the Faculty of Arts, and I'm also a professor in the Department of English. I've had the pleasure of working with and supervising several Tomlinson scholars in the past, and I'm delighted to be here today in the capacity as moderator. The three Tomlinson scholars you're going to hear from have been working hard to prepare their presentations in a challenging format. They each have 20 slides, time to show for 20 seconds each, six minutes and 40 seconds total to showcase the contributions of their research. At the end of the three presentations, there will be a Q&A period. You can submit your questions for the presenters through the web form link shown on screen, as well as in the video descriptions of this live stream. Our first presenter is Martin Giraldo Hoyas, a doctoral candidate from the Department of History and Classical Studies. Martin began his doctoral studies at McGill University in 2019. He holds a Master of Arts in History from the University of Saskatchewan, Saskatoon, 2018, and a bachelor's degree in history from the National University of Columbia, Bogota, 2013. Located in the interdisciplinary crossroads between social, agrarian, and environmental histories, his doctoral research explores the agroecologies of freedom created by Afro-Columbian communities in the Cauca River Valley, covering the period between the abolition of slavery and the takeoff of a sugarcane agro-industry. Let's invite Martin to present the Harvests of Freedom, Peasants and Nature, and the Formation of Cauca River Valley's Landscape Columbia. In my doctoral research, I study the history of the peasant societies that emerged out of slavery in the Cauca River Valley, looking at the agricultural systems and ecological relations through which they actively participated in the configuration of Colombia society, economy, and landscapes. Located in southwestern Colombia's Andes Mountains, the Cauca River Valley has been in the spotlight of agricultural development projects for the last 100 years due to its exceptional environmental advantages for tropical agriculture. In the Cold War context of the 1950s, however, the valley became a strategic place to supply the vacuum in sugar demand left by the Cuban Revolution. Since then, sugar monoculture has expanded dramatically with a significant impact over native ecosystems and the livelihood of small hoarder farmers as well. My research sheds light to the agency of actors that have been obscured by the narratives and economic forces of monoculture and development. Despite of the oppression and racialized inequality rooted in slavery, post-emancipation peasants managed to achieve significant levels of autonomy to make decisions about their own lives in relation with the valley's nature. They built an outstanding agroecological heritage based on the production of cacao, which served farmers, uh, which several farmers still defend today as a response to the homogenizing power of monoculture. I believe their ways of doing things can teach us valuable lessons about where to go in the design of a new socioecological transition. For this purpose, I found in the concept of landscape a powerful framework to trace the physical imprints and cultural choices of historically marginalized actors. From the perspective of cultural geography, landscapes are both processes and testimony of the relations established by societies with nature through time and across space. Recent literature from the field of environmental history has taken notable steps in underlying the historical significance of the relationships between Afro-Latin American populations and neotropical ecosystems within and outside of the plantations. For instance, Carney, Rogers, Leal, and De La Torre have documented the meaningful ways how African enslaved people and their descendants in the Americas took active part in the formation of landscapes. 
not only through labor, but also through their ingenuity and cultural creativity. In order to grasp every kind of historical evidence useful to follow the process of Cauca River Valley's landscape, my research integrates diverse sources from archival documents, agronomic studies, traveler journals, historical cartography, photographs, and oral history. In the archives, I focus in finding ways to systematize and analyze the rich information contained in notarial deck records. Currently, I'm processing over 1,000 land transactions produced between mid 19th and early 20th centuries with abundant social, spatial, and environmental data. Through a historical geographical information system, I'm able to georeference the information contained in historical maps and spatially locate the notarial data to reconstruct historical patterns of land use and landscape transformation. Additionally, I'm conducting oral interviews with elder farmers, peasant leaders, and farmers associations in the framework of a podcast pro project I co-produce with cacao scholars and cacao farmers in the Valley with the support of the National University of Colombia. Cacao Grafia's podcast aims to visualize and give value to the cacao tradition in the Valley. Some preliminary results of this exploration point at the crucial role played by cacao agriculture in the persistence of post-emancipation peasants in, Cau in the Cauca River Valley. Through the farming and marketing of cacao, former enslaved people set roots for enduring communities and build the basis for a local market network. Because of its perennial and arboreal characteristics, cacao trees take around three years to bear fruit. But once a tree is productive, it can heal for over 80 years in non-seasonal harvest seasons. By planting a cow, Cauca Valley's farmers created long-term bonds with the land, making a statement against the conditions of captivity and disenfranchisement. A sort of man-made forest, the agroecosystem of cacao involved a complex network of relationships between farmers' household, cacao trees, forest, and the Cauca River. Together with cacao, farmers could produce subsistent food staple, and destructive labor in the cacao tal permitted free time for hunting and fishing activities. The Obroma cacao is native from these inter-Andean valleys, and it thrived on wetlands and forests, the same areas where free people of color found shelter away from the landed states that privileged dry and flat spaces for cattle ranching. By producing cacao in flutable areas, peasants found a resilient strategy to relate with the hydrologic cycles of the Cauca River, which floods constantly threaten transport and settlement. This agroecological strategy relied on the use of native biodiversity and improved resilience levels to climatic variations. The economic and political instability in Colombia throughout the 19th century undermined the territorial power of Cauca's landed elites, allowing peasant communities to achieve higher levels of autonomy through the economy of cacao. For a fair period of time, cacao provided the har the harvest for freedom in the Cauca River Valley. My research contributes to document the role of post-emancipation peasants in shaping a landscape later, later devoured by sugar's commodity frontier. It nourishes the historical analysis about the influential roles of Afro-descendant peasantries in the greater Caribbean, their ecological networks, and their agency in the formation of post-slavery societies. Today, however, numerous smallholder farmers struggle to maintain the agrarian tradition left by their ancestors. By raising awareness and learning from this history, I aim to contribute in the recovery of Cauca Valley's cacao agroecological heritage. Thank you very much. Our next presenter is Muhammad Taha Manzoor from Mechanical Engineering. Taha is a PhD student at the Thermal Energy Lab at McGill University. He completed his undergrad from National University of Sciences and Technology in Pakistan. Later, he joined Active Materials Lab at Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology in South Korea, where he completed his master's degree. Currently, he's working on understanding the conversion of solar energy to thermal energy and energy storage using molten salts. Taha has published several scientific articles in renowned journals such as Solar Energy and Advanced Functional Materials. Today, Taha will be presenting Thermal Batteries Storing the Sun in Salts. Hello, everyone. I am Taha Manzoor, and today I'll be talking about thermal batteries that is to store the sun in salts. 
So the major problem with most of the renewable systems is that they are intermittent in nature. By intermittence, I mean that sun is not always out there. It's there for only a certain number of hours, and then we have the nighttime. Therefore, we need to store energy as long as it is available so that we can utilize it later. One of the most common methods can be seen here. We can couple a solar panel with a battery so that we can store the surplus amount of energy during the daytime and we can utilize it later. However, there are some major problems with battery systems. Batteries need continuous management and they need to be replaced over time. Moreover, batteries use toxic materials which are not good for our environment. Finally, the batteries are good enough only on a scale of 24 hours of storage, anything beyond that, and batteries become highly inefficient and very expensive. There is another problem with batteries as well. If we look at the total industrial energy demand, we can clearly see that only 26% is for electricity, whereas 74% demand is actually for heat. Right now, only 9% renewables are fulfilling this industrial heat demand, and we are majorly relying on non-renewable sources. When you store energy in batteries, you have to convert from electricity to heat. Whenever you do that, you incur some losses and the cost goes up. This is especially true for high temperature processes, such as production of stainless steel and cement. Therefore, we need some alternative options. Our idea is to use salts. Salts are non-toxic, they are abundantly available, and they are of the same cost as your table salt. You can heat these salts using solar energy and convert them to fluids. These fluids then have the ability to retain and store energy for a very long time at a very high temperature. This makes them an ideal candidate for thermal battery. Let's look at a real system. So we have a field of mirrors using which we can concentrate the solar energy onto a receiver. Now inside the receiver, we have molten salt. We can heat this salt and then store it later at these two tanks placed at the ground level. There are some new configurations coming up every day. For example, we can install a secondary mirror and deflect the incoming beam. The advantage is that then you can place all your system on the ground level. Now, you do not have to pump your salts again and again onto a top of a receiver. Therefore, the system is very simple, there is no complexity, and you save a lot of cost and energy during operation. Here is what I mean by a thermal battery. Using a field of mirrors, we are concentrating solar energy into this big tank. This tank already contains molten salt. Here, the red part represents the hot salt, and the blue part represents the cold salt. So during the daytime, the volume of hot salt is increasing, and during nighttime, we can simply discharge this energy. We can connect it to steam generator and produce electricity using steam turbines. Or we can directly dispatch this energy as heat to fulfill the 74% industrial heat demand. In short, this is a two-in-one, very compact system. However, these technologies are pretty new, and right now we do not fully understand what's happening inside this tank. Therefore, we cannot predict its behavior, and we cannot come up with ideal and optimal system design for our industrial partners. Moreover, these salts are highly corrosive in nature. By this, I mean that you will need special materials to make these tanks. If you look at the thermal energy storage cost for different salts at different temperatures, we can clearly see that as soon as we go to higher temperatures, the major chunk of cost is actually coming from the hot tank material. Again, you have to remember that we need to use special grades of stainless steel to contain these highly corrosive high temperature salts. These special materials are very expensive and that makes the whole cost of this system go up. Our idea is to use concrete. Concrete is the most commonly available construction material. If we can make these tanks out of concrete, then this major chunk of cost is expected to go down. This will significantly improve the market share of these new technologies. Here is how we investigated these tanks in our labs. So we have a lab scale storage tank. We used some special additives and some special layers and coatings to improve the response of common concrete in these high temperature, highly corrosive conditions. Then we wrapped the whole system in insulation and installed thermocouples at various locations. Thermocouples are just like our thermometers, which are used to monitor the temperature of this system as we melt our salts using these heaters. So we melted our salts, brought them to certain temperatures, and then poured out the salts. Then we investigated the inner surface of these tanks to look for any visible damage. Let's look at some results. 
So the common concrete, which did not contain any special additives or coatings, clearly got attacked by these salts. And we cannot use this structure for containing these salts. However, the engineered concrete, which contains some special additives, some special coatings, did not show any visible signs of attack. This is a very promising result, which proves that this cheap engineered concrete can be used to contain these highly corrosive high temperature salts. Now moving on, we are interested in knowing what happens inside this tank when we try to melt our salts using solar energy. For that purpose, we have developed some theoretical models. These models take into account different input values and tries to predict the uh, outcome of, uh, of the system. So using this model, we have identified some key parameters which influence our system's performance. Now we have a very good idea of an optimal system design. However, these findings are st still theoretical and in order for them to make it to industry and real plants, we need to first validate them experimentally. For that very purpose, we have built this experimental facility. This experimental facility uses a solar simulator which replicates the real life conditions in our lab. So using this high flux solar simulator, we are testing different storage tanks, using different molten salts, and we are trying to validate and match our theoretical findings. Once done, we will be able to present an optimal system design to our industrial partners. This research will help in fighting the climate change problem. Finally, I would like to thank Dr. Tom Ninson for his generous grant and also all these wonderful organizations who have supported us in our research. Thank you all for listening. Our final presenter is Benjamin Crosby, a first year PhD student in ecclesiastical history at McGill University's School of Religious Studies. He comes to McGill from Yale University where he received a BA in Religious Studies and a Master of Divinity degree from Yale's Divinity School. A student of Professor Torrance Kirby at McGill, Ben works on the relationship between the English Reformation and the Continental Reformations. He's particularly interested in how early leaders of the Reformed Church of England, such as John Jewell and Richard Hooker, understood the relationship between their church and Reformed and Lutheran churches on the continent. Ben is also a priest in the Episcopal Church of the United States, currently serving in the Anglican Church of Canada. Let's invite Ben to present Both Sides Be Christians, Good Friends and Brethren, John Jewell, The Apology of the Church of England, and the unity of Protestantism. I want to first thank Dr. Tomlinson um, both for, for making these, these talks available, but also for the, the generous gift that allows me to, uh, to study here at McGill. Um, and I'm very excited to share with you today my presentation entitled, Both Sides Be Christians, Good Friends, and Brethren, John Jewell, The Apology of the Church of England and Protestant Unity. I want to begin by, by zooming back a little bit from the weeds of the 16th century, where we'll spend most of our time thinking about Christian unity as a, a theological problem that's a, a perennial problem. Uh, you can see on the left uh, a passage from the Gospel according to John, where, where Jesus, before his crucifixion, prays for the unity of his followers. Really, ever since then, um, unity has been a, a marker of Christian faith and practice. And if you look then uh, at the, the screen on the right, the image there, you can, you can see why this perennial Christian focus on unity might pose a problem for the 16th century Protestant reformers. The 16th century witnessed an explosion of types of Christianity, types which not only split off from Rome, but also disagreed with each other was not, of course, the first major division in the church, um, but all the same, for those looking to defend the Protestant settlement, the, the diversity of Protestant um, denominations, sects, churches was a problem. One defender of Protestantism, who I'll be looking at today, who sought to address this problem is John Jewell, who's a bishop in the Church of England. He embraced the Protestant cause during the reign of King Edward VI and studied with the important Italian reformer, Peter Martyr Vermeule. He fled to the continent with Vermeule during the reign of Mary I when, when England was returned to Catholicism, but when, England, uh, but when Elizabeth, excuse me, took the throne and returned the Church of England to Protestantism, he came back and was made Bishop of Salisbury. He would be a key leader of the Elizabethan Church, uh, really one of the, the architects thereof. 
But what I'll be focusing on is a controversy that he was involved in. Uh, on November 26th, 1559, he issued what's called the Challenge Sermon, uh, setting out a, a set of Protestant propositions and challenging any Roman Catholic to, to prove them wrong on the basis of scripture in the early church. He expanded some of these themes into his 1562 Apology for the Church of England. Now, in 1564, a Catholic priest by the name of Harding, who was English but fled in exile to the Low Countries, responded to that challenge sermon, and the next year uh, issued a, a book called a, a Confutation, which was a, a book-length rebuttal of Jewell's apology. Uh, Jewell will then respond to Harding um, with a defense of the apology in 1567, Harding will then issue uh, another volume uh, critiquing Jewell's defense, and finally Jewell will update his defense um, shortly before his death. Um, so we have here some uh, really a, a decade of theological controversy between these two men about the legitimacy of the Reformation in England. And one of the accusations um, against Protestants against English Protestants that I'll be focusing on is, is one of disunity, that, that Protestants not only split from Rome, but are disunited amongst each other and indeed anathematizing each other, and so they cannot be the true church. Jewell will respond to this by, by making an argument for a unified Protestantism. He will name uh, Martin Luther and Ulrich Zwingli, the, the German and Swiss reformers who were, were two of the most important early reformers, um, as engaged in a, a shared Protestant project, uh, as, as being both most excellent men sent of God to give light to the whole world, as he writes, uh, even though uh, the two men couldn't stand each other and had profound and deep theological disagreements. For Jewel, this, this shared um, God-given mission to preach the gospel is, is more basic than whatever disagreements uh, may exist. Um, and in fact, he will, he will argue then that, that Luther and Zwingli's followers continue to agree on essentials, even as they may disagree on various other points. You, you see here a passage from the Apology from which my presentation takes its title, um, that for those persons who are called Zwinglians and Lutherans, uh, both parties of this intra-Protestant debate, both sides be Christians, good friends, and brethren. And Jew will go on to say that this is true because they they vary not betwixt themselves upon the principles and foundations of our religion. They, they share similar views about God, about how God works salvation, the nature of the gospel, and, and whatever disagreements they have, which are, are mainly about the Lord's Supper, um, our minor. Now, Harding will repost to this and, and will argue that, no, no, the divisions are in fact very deep indeed. Um, he will accuse Jewell, in fact, of making a foul lie in suggesting that divisions among Protestants are not so important. Uh, for Harding, the divisions are real and, and threaten any account of articulating a unified Protestant project. Jewell then will respond to this in, in several ways. Uh, in his defense of the apology, he will point out that there are serious uh, disagreements, divergences among uh, theologians in the early church who are nonetheless both or all held to be orthodox. He will also suggest that the Protestants simply need to get together to hold a, a general council or a great conference, and they'll be able to, to hash out their, their differences. And, and Jewel can argue this again because of his commitment to this, this basic essential Protestant unity. The, the secondary issues on which Protestants disagree um, can, he thinks, be, be hashed out um, if the Protestants all get together. So now we're some 500 years after this, uh, this dispute, this controversy, and one might argue that Harding's arguments have been vindicated. Um, after all, Lutherans and Protestants remain, excuse me, the Lutherans and the Reformed remain uh, to have separate churches, and indeed Protestant sects have proliferated in, in a way that neither man uh, probably could have imagined. And yet, we might also read the, the years since the controversy as, as Jewell's vindication, or at the very least, a sense that Jewell was ahead of his time. See, this, this strategy of, 
of differentiating between core agreement and, and secondary disagreements within Protestantism has been crucial for Protestant ecumenism. For example, the, the Leuenberg Concord in 1972 between the European Lutheran and Reformed churches. In this sense, we might say that Protestants have continued to use Jewel's strategy as they seek to live out Jesus' command that we began with, recorded in the Gospel of John, that all of his followers may be one. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to Martin, Taha, and Ben for their presentations. We can now move to questions from the audience. And as a reminder to those listening, you can submit your questions for the presenters through the web forum screen, as well as in the video description of this live stream. So our first question is for Martin. Um, Martin, I really liked your conception of landscape as a kind of testimony. Are there specific examples of this in your research about the Cauca Valley that you could tell us more about? Well, hello, uh, thank you for the question. Um, actually, there is, and I'm exploring the actual imprints in the valley, in the valley's landscape left by these peasants, particularly in the floodable areas. Uh, the floodable areas have been told to be, uh, have passed through a strong process of drainage and desiccation. And this process is often uh, read through the eyes of, of monoculture. Yet what I have found is that through cacao agriculture and cacao agroecosystems, uh, these farmers managed to use the floodable areas in a sort of saying uh, more resilient way. And I found that is an amazing example of, of landscape processes that implies landscape transformations, yet no necessarily uh, changing, completely changing the hydrological cycles. So I guess that's a good example for that. Thank you. Uh, the next question is for Taha. Uh, Taha, I was really interested in hearing about the industrial demand for heat and electricity. Which industries would your battery be supporting? And how long do you think a battery like yours could remain in operation? Um, okay. so. For high temperature heat, as I mentioned, uh, there are like, I guess, most of the things that we use, for example, aluminum, um, stainless steel, cement. So all these uh, industries, they need high, like high temperature um, uh, heat. But then there are some uh, other industries uh, which do not require like those thousand degrees centigrade plus temperatures, but they still require a lot of heat. And I guess almost all industries which you will visit, even from beverages to any, they, they do require heat and heat is the main demand. And that's what I, show, I have shown in that graph that 74% of the industrial demand is actually for heat. Uh, so, um, so yeah, there are like 74% um, opportunities, I would say. Uh, and then about the uh, time uh, limit. So uh, these uh, batteries uh, are these systems uh, there has been, uh, they have been tested also uh, in one pilot project in Abu Dhabi uh, at Mustard Institute, and it showed that was a pilot small project that it can be uh, sufficiently be used to store energy for around eight to nine hours. But uh, we have some, um, uh, some other evidences which show that they are fine beyond like 24 hours, even up to one week. Uh, some people have also uh, shown these estimates. Uh, but then thing is that uh, you will require uh, better insulation and also um, there is also need for to identify the sectors right now which will require that kind of long duration. So probably in a case of uh, some catastrophe uh, or a long winter maybe, then we will need these uh, technologies for longer time. Uh, so yeah, uh, we, can clear, we can definitely say up to uh, on an order of weeks. Uh, is possible. Thank you. This one is for Ben. Ben, learning about Jewel was fascinating. Are there other figures from early modern England or the continent that have been influential in your research? 
Are there voices from the time who counter or complicate Jewel's approach to religious toleration? Yeah, thank you. That's a, a great question. Um, certainly attempts to, to draw together a, a sort of shared Protestant project are, uh, are of great concern to a, to a variety of, of figures in this time, both in England and outside of it. Um, on the continent, figures like, like John Calvin and Martin Busser are, uh, are deeply invested in various ways and in, in trying to, um, to heal the rifts that start to emerge within Protestantism in the 1520s. Um, the other figure that I look at the most uh, alongside um, Jewel is, is Richard Hooker, who is actually a, a protege of, of Jewel's, um, who is similarly, particularly in his, his doctrine of the of communion or, or the Lord's Supper, um, wants to, to, to provide an account that, um, that avoids, um, as it were, um, furthering conflict, and then perhaps sort of comes to comes around to, to solving it. Um, in terms of of complicating figures, I mean, I mean, certainly, right? I think I think there is a real extent to which um, Jewel in in making this claim is working against a, a truly um, massive amount of polemic and, and invective that various sorts of Protestants are, are directing at each other, which makes for um, fun, if not always perhaps edifying um, reading. So yes, so they're, they're certainly operating in a context where this claim of, of unity um, is a, a highly charged and contentious one. And you certainly have other figures um, going on who are, are concerned that, um, that such attempts to draw together divergent views um, threaten the, the truth of the gospel and perhaps the eternal salvation of, of the people involved. So, so certainly, certainly it is a complicated story and the only voices are not Jules or Huggers. Thank you. Okay, the next one is for Taha. Taha, what was the process of arriving at the combination of elements to mix with cements? Is this already in use in other countries? Uh, yeah, so as we said that we wanted to reduce the price, so we did not want anything which we add and then it's novel and unique and can only be made on a small scale, which will increase the cost of the engineered co concrete itself. So we made sure, uh, I cannot reveal the names right now because the, it is still uh, in the publication process, this work, uh, but all the um, additives that we used are the paints. They are commercially available. Uh, even they were acquired from within Canada from some, uh, uh, some companies which are working in construction. And uh, even we wanted to, when we wanted to buy them in small quantities, they said that just take them for free, for, for free samples, because these are like very common, very cheap uh, products uh, that they, they have been using. So none of this additive is uh, it, it, it's the one which you cannot find, or it's a new or unique thing. They all are already in use in industry. So uh, that's what uh, we made sure about these um, compositions. Great, thank you. Um, Martin, could you please speak a little bit more about your podcast and what kinds of topics it covers? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, the podcast is a project associated to my research, and we are actually conducting uh, interviews with elder farmers and uh, in a sort of uh, gathering together the oral histories for these communities, but at the same time to reveal the the to connect what is the common the community communities memories about these times with the actual research by agronomists, historians, and et cetera. So the podcast uh, tries to bring up light and create conscious about the, this huge past of cacao, which most of the people who lived here in the, in the valley, they, they are not aware of, and to bring that up to light and to learn from the experiences of these farmers in the past, uh, potential uh, agroecological practices for upcoming transitions and very much needed transitions in the ways of using land and, and designing landscapes. Thank you. Um, ben, this may be a silly question in context, but asking as a non-Christian, 
Could you briefly elaborate on the splitting of Christianity in the 16th century? How did we end up with this disagreement? Of course, I would be, be very glad to, and we'll, we'll try to do so, so briefly. So when I'm talking about the 16th century split, I'm, I'm in particular talking about a split that happens in, in Western Europe, right? There's sort of already um, during the, the Middle Ages been a split between what we now call the Eastern Orthodox Church and, and the Roman Catholic Church um, over a, a set of, of complicated questions that were, were generally um, had, had less to do about core matters of, of doctrine or Christian belief, but more about, um, frankly, sort of a ecclesial politics. Um, some will say that the same is true of the 16th century, um, but in, in short, um, there were a, a variety of reforming movements, um, first in Germany and Switzerland, but then over Europe that um, took issue both with, with certain um, practices associated with um, sort of the Roman Catholicism of its, of its day, um, primarily um, around the question of, of how um, salvation was, was conceptualized, what the Christian believer had, had to do in order to, to be in, in right relationship with God and, and, and get to heaven. Um, and then um, these, these sort of initial kind of doctrinal questions um, in part because of a rather ferocious attempt to, uh, to, to sort of smack down these, these agreements on the part of the, the Roman Catholic hierarchy um, really sort of exploded into a, a wide rejection um, in, in, again, um, much, much of Germany, um, in England, um, Scandinavia, France, parts of the Low Countries, of, of wide swabs of, of Roman Catholic doctrine, as well as the, the authority of the, of the Pope um, to, to determine indeed sort of what, what the contents of, of church doctrine are. Um, and, and of course, um, this, this sort of 16th century development um, also had a lot to do with, with changing relationships between the um, sort of growing power of, um, of secular authorities of, of various princes um, who often, um, whatever religious motives they might have also had, also had had political motives for wanting to um, uh, sort of support the, these Protestant reformers and diminish the power of, of Rome. Um, so yes, I, I hope that helps uh, a little bit. Um, a, a set of divisions or, or questions primarily having to do with uh, what someone needed to do to be saved um, began a movement that, that led to a, a widespread rejection of, of the power of the Roman Catholic Church and established divisions within Christianity that, as I said, um, still exist to this day. Thank you. Uh, okay, this is for Martin. Has Kakoa River Valley been compared to other rivers around the world which have played an important role in the old civilization, such as Indus River and current nation states? Can you speak a bit about this context? Uh, yes, uh, well, I'm not aware of current uh, comparative uh, research, but I guess definitely we can share some, some insights about uh, common processes. Uh, especially from the, the times of development projects in the 1950s and 60s, which uh, in, in tropical landscapes such as the Valley created like a, a huge emergency for, for commodities in the, in the external markets, in the world markets. Um, I guess I'm not aware of current comparisons, but I guess that would be a fascinating work to do in the future. Um, this one is for Taha. Taha, in the near and far future, what is the expectation and potential regarding the success of solar and thermal energy? What ethical challenges do you think we might face? Okay, yeah. So about the future, it's hard when it comes to energy, especially, I would say. Uh, I can just say that... Uh, not one technology will be able to solve all problems. Like we need to understand this. Um, we need to understand this as scientists and as general public, because this is everyone's concern now uh, that only like relying on maybe electrical vehicles is not gonna solve all the problems. As I showed you, you have electrical vehicles, but then you have the heat problem. 
So um, I, I won't say like this particular technology is the final answer. There are some other competing uh, technologies as well. For example, instead of using uh, molten salts, you can use uh, particles, for example, sand or rocks to do the same thing, but they have their own challenges. So the good thing about um, molten salts is that this uh, molten salt itself is not a new thing. We have been using it in industry for metal processing and uh, even if you go uh, to any plant, uh, you can find a big bath of uh, molten salt. So we know a lot about it. Then pumping uh, fluids and dealing with fluids is a little bit easier as compared to other, uh, for example, solid particles. So that's also um, another advantage. And then they are cheap and they are non-toxic. So that's why uh, uh, we believe that this technology has a long way to go. Um, and it has been uh, going really well. Uh, if you look at the past decade, there are some uh, commercial plants which are existing, uh, but they are like of different configuration on with, as compared to what I'm working on. So we are trying to like further reduce the cost, make it more compact um, and, and remove the uh, disadvantages that those current existing systems have. So uh, uh, yeah, in terms of like uh, ethical concerns, um, maybe labor, <laughs> how, how, how are you gonna build it? So then it again, again becomes a, 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 like a general problem, uh, which kind of varies from countries to countries, uh, but not no like ethical concern uh, as compared to, I would, I would say batteries because I'm not using any plastics, first of all. Uh, I'm not using any toxic material, it's not expensive. Uh, salts, um, they are like abundantly available. So this is not something very rare. Uh, so uh, yeah, I would still say like uh, there are other technologies which have also great potential. And in future, we will have a fleet of diver diversified technologies and uh, only then we can achieve this 100% renewable grid. Yeah. Thank you so much. So this is a question for all three of you and I'm glad someone is asking it because otherwise I would. Um, maybe we could answer in the order in which you presented. So the question is, thank you all three presenters for such interesting and honestly diverse range of topics. How and why did you end up researching these specific topics? What was the journey here to your PhD studies? So going in order, let's start with Martin. Okay, yeah, well, that could be a long answer, so I'm going to try to be short. Uh, well, I, I, I've been studying uh, agricultural history, like Colombian agricultural history for a while. And uh, although I, I'm not originally from the Cauca Valley, I've been had my approaches to the valley thanks to uh, research projects. And I realized how important it is to talk about this, this particular landscape when talking about Colombia's agriculture. We often relate Colombia with coffee and we relate it in the Caribbean with bananas and with many other products. But we neglect the place where actual agro-industry development happened. So I came to the Valley, I studied first the, I, I like to say like the, the actors with power of landscape transformation. I studied the, the landlords, the sugar mills, but after finishing my master, I realized, okay, we're missing a big part here and we're missing is these actors that are not commonly uh, appearing in the sources or in, this, or, or in most of the studies, although there is uh, significant literature about it. So I decided to focus my uh, doctoral uh, research in, in the peasants. And, and for that, is, uh, that's, that's the way how I got here. And yeah, I guess. That answers the question. Thank you. Okay, Ben. Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, so first, I think I'm um, just as an as an intellectual. Um, I'm so sorry. I went out of order because I'm looking at the order of you <laughs> in my screen. So sorry, Taha. Well, my mistake. Go ahead, Ben. Should I still go? Okay, great. Please, please, please. Yes. Yeah. My, my, my mistake. No, no, no worries. Um, I think you know, sort of in, intellectually, um, this this moment in the 16th century is a uh, a moment of, of incredibly rich theological knowledge production where the 
the crisis that European Christianity is is pushed into is is forcing these these thinkers to um, to reconceptualize to think through anew um, a lot of the the kind of core commitments of the Christian faith um, in a way that is both very interesting in its its own right um, and also you know has as I tried to gesture to in my talk, you know, has sort of structured a lot of the, the world that we live in today. Um, but more personally, as, as well as, um, as was mentioned in my introduction, so I, I am an Anglican priest, I am an, an heir um, in, to, to the English Reformation, to these attempts by figures like Jewel to, to think through um, this particular version of, of, of Protestant identity um, and this, this, uh, you know, this passage from John that I began with, this, this prayer that we may be one, um, is, is something that um, matters to me not only as an intellectual exercise, but also quite personally. Um, and so my, my hope is that my work um, not only enables us to, to better understand um, these, these questions, these debates in the 16th century contributes to the scholarly conversation there, but may also be of use um, to those who who are confessionally Christian and trying to work out questions of um, of unity amidst difference or division that continue uh, that Christians ask today as much as they did in the 16th century. Thank you. Okay, and now Taha. Yeah. So um, um, being an engineer, um, it's really hard to pinpoint your interest, especially if you're a mechanical engineer. This field is very vast. Uh, so I worked on uh, various topics in my bachelor's. It was different. My master's was completely different what I'm doing right now. Um, so yeah, I guess I, I just wanted to do research and then find good um, uh, research questions. That would I, that what I would say in general um, about in like choosing this particular topic, obviously the, um, uh, the climate change uh, and everything that was going around back in 2018 was a factor. But to be honest, it's um, in engineering, it's not like you cannot pinpoint your interest right away from the day one. It kind of develops and matures over time. Uh, so uh, uh, after working with a lot of different topics, this is what I liked. And uh, as I said that, uh, this doesn't stop here. It's not the end of my journey. Um, um, in future, I might be doing something else, but I just wanted to make sure that whatever I do uh, contributes uh, to something good. Uh, and I would suggest everyone just, just focus on that and you'll find a lot of things. Thank you. Well, that's a good note to end on. It's uh, time to wrap up the Q&A and the 2022 Tomlinson Talks. Uh, and I'd like to take a moment to thank our scholars again, as well as the Tomlinson Talk organizers and our McGill Multimedia Services team without whose skill and support, none of us could be here. And also our audience for joining us. And of course, Dr. Tomlinson himself, without whom uh, we might not have uh, these brilliant scholars in our midst at McGill. We hope to see you in person in 2023. Thank you for attending today.